Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praises due to Allah alone. We all praise Him and we seek His help. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah alone. And I bear witness that His last messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Brothers and sisters, welcome to another live edition of our program Ask Koda. And here is a quick reminder with our contact informations. The first phone line, phone number is a landline, uh, code 002 then 023 and the cell phone is uh, code 002 then 0100546 The two WhatsApp numbers are uh, code 001347-80625, and the last number is uh, code 001361-489-1503. Brothers and sisters, without any further ado, the first question I have is from Khalil uh, Kirillan. is asking, I have a question uh, about earning money from an Islamic content website that shares ahadith and sunnah. Is it permissible to earn money from this website or is it forbidden? As far as the permissibility, yes, it is permissible, especially if you're in need for this money in order to maintain the website, in order to expand, hire more people to input a hadith and statements and so on. Uh, if the person does that absolutely for the sake of Allah without any compensation, his word is greater, of course. But as far as earning money out of such website, it is permissible. The second question is from Muhammad Kiba. Brother Muhammad is asking, is it true that all dua are kept back until we send the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? It's a beautiful question, Kiba. And uh, there is a hadith in this regard. It's a statement said by Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. And the hadith is collected by Imam Tirmidhi. It's a fair hadith. In this hadith, Umar al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu said, إِنَّ الدُّعَاءَ مَقُوفٌ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَا يَصْعَدُ مِنْهُ شَيْءٌ حَتَّى تُصَلِّ عَلَى نَبِيِّكَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ So according to Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, that one supplication is مَقُوفٌ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ hanging between the earth and the heavens. For one supplication to be accepted and granted an answer, it needs to be raised to the heavens and accepted by Allah. So any supplication is hanging between the heavens and the earth, waiting for sending the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in order to be accepted. Hatta tusalli ala nabika sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Accordingly, it's a sunnah while making dua to send the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him, said, and that is in one of three, of three levels. The first level is by sending as-salah, was-salam, peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in its beginning and in the middle and by the end of you making your dua. Like you're asking Allah to facilitate getting a new job for you or to be promoted. So you praise Allah, you send the peace and the blessings upon his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then you make your dua and send another peace and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad. Then make dua again and wrap it up by sending the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is said that each and every time that you send the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, it is definitely accepted. Since Allah has commanded so, in Surah Al-Ahzab he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا So the Almighty Allah and His angels, they send the salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ. Allah blesses him. The angels invoke Allah to bless him. So all who you believe, you too should enjoy 
uh, <coughs> join Allah and his messenger by sending the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second level is by, <coughs> by sending the peace and the blessings in the beginning of your supplication and by the end. And the third level, which is the least, at least in the beginning, because in the sound hadith, which is narrated by Fudala ibn Ubaid, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, إِذَا صَلَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَبْدَأْ بِتَحْمِيدِ اللَّهِ وَالثَّنَائِ عَلَيْهِ Whenever any of you uh, should make dua or pray, then you should begin by praising the Almighty Allah, and second that by sending the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad. Such as saying, Allahumma laka alhamdu kullu ala niyatuhu wa sirru. Okay, this is the way you praise Allah. One of many, many ways. Alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'hdihi wa nasta'gfiru. Then you send the peace and the blessing. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Or as salatul Ibrahimiyya, you, you say it all the way, kama sallayta ala Ibrahima. وعلى آل إبراهيم all the way to the end إنك حميد مجيد ثم ليدعو بما شاء then let him invoke Allah the Almighty as much as you want من أراد أن يسأل الله حاجته فليبدأ بالصلاة على النبي وليختم بالصلاة على النبي وليسأل حاجته بينهما فإن الصلاة على النبي مقبولة every time you say اللهم صل على محمد is guaranteed to be accepted so if you say it in the beginning and you say it by the end, then the most generous, the Almighty Allah will never uh, take the first and the last which envelops your prayer and rob your supplication. So the bottom line, this is one of the best means of enhancing the acceptance of your uh, dua or supplication, brothers and sisters. Uh, Jin Osman, Jin is saying, uh, why isn't it an innovation to listen to Quran through mobile or post Islamic teachings on social media? Since it's a bid'ah and our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, didn't do it through mobile phones or social media. For a while you may think, you know what, you shouldn't answer this question. But I believe we should tackle a question like that. So that to educate the youth, it's obvious that this is a young man who is asking this question and to differentiate between the bid'ah and the inventions, you know, and utilizing the new technology and the new access means to deliver the message of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Is it permissible to eat with a fork and a spoon? Is it permissible to hold a knife in one hand and a fork in another hand and to cut the meat? and eat with the fork, as long as you're eating with the right hand, it's permissible. But Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to eat with his fingers. Well, if you want to eat with your fingers, fine. And if you eat with the spoon, with the fork, well, that's perfectly fine as well. I'll continue after this uh, call, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Um Saddam from the USA, welcome to Ask Koda. Assalamu alaikum. Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Sheikh, how are you? Barakallahu feekum for the whole team of us, Khuda and Khuda TV. We are really getting so much information from you. Barakallahu feekum. Wa feekum barak, sister. Thank you so much. Sheikh, I have a question. Okay, after Salah, the Askar, I ask you this question before too, but what my question was that, do I have to say A'uzu Billahi Minash Shaitanur Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim after every time I I recite Qul Hu Allahu Ahad like three times in Fajr and Maghrib, or do I have to like say just one time and recite with Bismillah, or just one time A'uzu Billahi Bismillah and then recite three times Qul Hu Allahu Ahad Falak and Nas. Or Aital Kursi. And if I do the Ruqiyah, do I have to say the A'uzu Billah, Bismillah? Uh, every time I recite like seven times Aital Kursi or any other surah from Quran or ayah from Quran. Okay. Jazakallah khairan kaseerah. Thank you, sister. I'm uh, Saddam from the USA. Next. 
Brother Muhammad from Somalia. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa Dr. Muhammad Ta'ala. How are you, brother? Really, I would like to become da'i, but what I can do, please give me advice. Sure, 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 inshallah. All right. I'll get your uh, questions, inshallah. Our sister from the USA and our brother from Somalia, mashallah. We have the whole world in, uh, you know, watching Huda TV by the grace of Allah, mashallah. So brother Jen, who's asked about, you know, utilizing the social media and mobile phones to share a hadith or to read Quran and said the Prophet didn't do it. Well, the Prophet didn't have a cell phone. They didn't have a phone to begin with. And I promise you, if there was landlines or cell phones or Apple or Samsung at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu he would most definitely have used them. And he would have formed WhatsApp groups to, uh, to spread and share a hadith with the companions to educate those who are in southern of the peninsula or in Persia or in Asham. You know, the bid'ah is a new way of doing an act of worship which is prescribed. So praying uh, Maghrib four rakahs instead of three, this is uh, an act of innovation. Making a new festival or celebration other than what Allah has prescribed, this is an innovation. But compiling the Quran which was written entirely in scriptures to put it all in one volume is not bad at all. Because the Quran is the same. No changes have happened to that. It just made it easier for people to read it in one volume. And it made it safer to save the Quran in one volume. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Afdal from Ireland. Ya Afdal. Assalamu alaikum. Hello? Hello. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless you and give you the jannah. Then you are doing very good, you know. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. May Allah accept. Uh, Sheikh, I have one uh, emotional question. You know, can I ask you? Yeah, go ahead, please. I'm listening. Uh, uh, I live in Ireland. Uh, five years before, uh, I was going online, to, uh, looking Muslim girl to get married. You know. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, find a Muslim girl in Morocco. And after talking to two days, I ask her, can I go to Morocco, ask your hand to get married, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, she told me, okay, come up to five, six months because she has been studying. I went up to six months in Morocco, ask her hand. Her dad says she is not going to give because I'm not from Morocco, you know? Ah, uh, okay. Then she, uh, then she told me, okay, wait for one year. Then my dad changed her mind, you know. Mm. Then I go went again after one year in Morocco, ask her hand. Her dad says that uh, I, I'm not still. She, he's not to be because I'm not from Morocco, you know. Mm. Then I was so upset that like uh, we came down twice and two years gone. And then because when I'm travel, I always carry Quran because I love to read Quran when I'm traveling. Mm. And I asked her, like, can you promise me that you are going to marry me? Uh, because if I come back next year, after three years, four years, and after that, if you cannot marry, I will waste my time. Mm. Then she told me, okay, I can hold Quran and promise that I will marry you. Then, okay, then so she holds the Quran and promise that, okay, well, I'm going to marry you, whatever happens, if, if she don't die, you know. Then after, now it's nearly five years, you know, now she's after, nearly like she lost after Ramadan. She's not talking anything. And now I'm thinking if she gets married to someone else, is that marriage going to be halal for her? So she promised me, you know, by holding Quran and promise Allah as well. Uh, That's Af my question. Afdal, you're really, really patient. You're a very patient man. I mean, it's like I'm reading a novel. How many years this has been going on? It's, it's over nearly five years. Five years? Oh, yeah. man. You're really patient. I, I doubt I would have done the same. Or not even half of that. I will answer you, inshallah, brother. Afdal. Unless if you have another question or something else that you want to say. Did you, did you get my questions? Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. So if she, if she gets married, 
and she promised me she's going to marry. You know, that's that's the question. You know. Yes. Thank you, Sheikh. You're most welcome. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you, Abdal. Mashallah, it's very interesting. So our sister from the USA asked about uh, reciting the adhkar after the prayer. And among the adhkar is Ayat al-Kursi and al-Mu'awwidat. Especially after Fajr and uh, Maghrib, you recite al-Mu'awwidat. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, qul a'udhu rabb al-falaq, and qul a'udhu rabb al three times. So she said, do I have to recite al-isti'adha, say a'udhu billahi min al-shaytan rajim before the recitation of each surah and every time you recite at al-kursi? No. The answer is in the ayah. إِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ So al-isti'adha or saying, I seek refuge with Allah again is the outcast Satan. يَعْنِي أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ O a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim min hamzihi wa nafkhihi wa nafthih is to be said only once in the beginning of your recitation to keep Satan off your shoulders, to keep him away from you while reciting Qur'an. But it is not prescribed before the beginning of every surah. I mean in the prayer. How many times do we recite? If you pray in Asr, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha four times. It's only once in the beginning of the prayer. After the beginning supplication and before Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, you recite, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, then al-basmala, then the surah. And you don't recite al-isti'adha afterward for the purpose of recitation. So al-isti'adha, it is prescribed only in the very beginning of your recitation. Also, while you're reciting, if you feel like, you know, you've been distracted, Satan is whispering to you, you're not really focusing on your prayer, it is prescribed to make isti'ada by saying, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim But it is not prescribed before every single surah to recite al-isti'ada uh, again and again and again. Muhammad from Somalia, mashallah, he would like to be a da'i. The key is, if you are sincere in your intention, and if there is a will, then there is a way. And once you're sincere in your intention, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said to this companion, Usduqillaha yasduq. Be true to Allah in your intention, Allah will fulfill your intention. Allah will deliver, make an effort. In order to be a da'i, like if you want to become a doctor, or an engineer, or a pilot, you ask, what do I need to learn? Which school I need to enroll in? What degree do I have to get in order to learn? In order to be a da'i, or to be a scholar, or to be a doctor, or a pilot. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ To become knowledgeable in the deen, you have to acquire knowledge, seek knowledge, learn Arabic, learn Quran, the Ahkam, Fiqh, Tafsir, Hadith. So if you can enroll in an Islamic school from the scratch to learn, this is the ultimate way to become a da'i. If you don't have an access to a physically existing school, then the alternative is to study online. And studying online nowadays provides a great alternative to studying on a boarding school or in regular schools, provided you follow a syllabus of a school or a university to obtain a degree to become a faqih or a mufassir or a alim. Then afterward, you can become a professional da'i. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Muhammad from Gambia. Ya Muhammad, assalamu alaikum. Muhammad, Muhammad from Gambia. Tayyib, uh, brother Muhammad, try again. It seems like you've muted your own line or your phone. Try again, please. Okay. Um, our brother Afdal from Ireland. I don't know if you followed his story. It seems like we were disconnected for a while 
from the Facebook page, but we're back. So those who didn't hear the question of Afdal from Ireland, and I hope you're there, brother Afdal. Well, he met with a girl, maybe online. He showed interest in marrying her, and he wanted to marry, but he traveled to Morocco. Her father refused. Then she said, give me one year. Uh, maybe he will change his mind. And our brother was very patient, very loyal. Then another year and a third year, a total five years. And she promised him. She put her hand on the Quran and she promised him that she will marry him. Fact number one. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا نكاح إلا بولي وشاهد يعد. So for the marriage to be valid, you would need two things. The agreement, the consent of the wali, the guardian of the girl, and the witnesses. If you don't have that, the marriage will be invalid. So if a girl gives herself in marriage without the consent of her guardian, her marriage is not an Islamic marriage. It's not recognized as marriage before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is really problematic. Second fact. Sometimes a person who is in love, he becomes like under magical spell. He sees none but this person. And the Prophet ﷺ said, الْحُبُّ يَعْمِي وَيَصُمْ So whenever somebody is in love, he behaves like he is blind, like he is deaf. He doesn't see, he doesn't hear. But what his heart is telling him about this person, his or her loved one. That's a fact that we have to acknowledge. But we also address the parents and the families of both the boys and the girls. If a good person proposes to your child, your son or your daughter, or your child showed interest in marrying a good person, you should facilitate that. It doesn't really matter whether he's an Arab or non-Arab whether he's from Morocco or from Tunisia or from Egypt or from Ireland, if he's a good person, if he can verify that, Bismillah, facilitate this marriage, especially when you know that the couple having chemistry and they have a lot of things in common and they actually want to get married. You should bless such marriage and facilitate it. What if it is not working, brother Afdal? Drop it. Move on. I know that this is heartbreaking. And how could you say that Sheikh had been waiting for five years? I told you, if it was me, I wouldn't wait for one year. I'm telling you. Life is really important. And there are a lot of major things in life that we have to achieve. Rather than just waiting for five years and ten years. And only God knows. Because you know that the family is not agreeing to your marriage. And now she is not answering you. When somebody promises, you should make a promise that you can afford to fulfill. If her father is still alive and she knows that as long as he's there and she has a guardian, and maybe he has a, a point, so she's not able to marry you, how could she give a vow or a promise, a ahd or a covenant that she cannot afford to fulfill? And now we are saying that maybe she got married to somebody else. Could she actually do that? The answer to your question, yes. If she got married officially, her marriage is valid because she had no relationship whatsoever with you or with anybody else. There was no commitment. I'm talking about legal commitment, marriage contract. Even if you guys were engaged, any party of the engagement, any one of the fiancés, has the right to drop it, call it off, even without showing reasons. I know it's rude, it is cruel, she promised me, but you're asking me whether her marriage is valid to the other guy. Yes, it's valid. And perhaps she has to give a kafara for a vow or a promise that she could not keep and could not fulfill. May Allah guide all of us to what is best. <clears throat> Uh, I know that, mashallah, we have many questions. Um, like Farooq Wahid is asking, what is the proper way of offering 
sujood in salah for those who pray while sitting on chair. The Prophet sallallahu showed us, salli qa'iman, if you can stand up, then you should stand up in the prayer. If you can, then sit down. And in the case of sitting down, you make ruku'a have way so that your sujood will be a little further down. Again, I'm going to present. You pray while you're sitting on your seat or somebody or in their bed or wheelchair or in the plane. Allahu Akbar. You cannot stand up. Allahu Akbar. You recited Al-Fatiha. Then Allahu Akbar for Rukuwa. Subhana Rabbi al azim But this is not complete Rukuwa. Correct. Because I'm not standing. Then in sujood, it will be further down. Do I have to put my forehead on a pillow or on the ground? Well, if you can actually, if you're sitting on the ground, if you're sitting on the ground, and you can make a complete sujood where your palms, your knees, your forehead and nose, your toes can touch the ground, then you should do that. But if you're sitting on a chair, then you don't have, and you cannot make sujood, then you don't have to put a pillow or a hard object in order to touch. It will be sufficient to go for sujood further down than in the case of ruku' or bound down. We'll take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Yes, indeed, we do, uh, we do have uh, a problem with the internet connection today. They're working on it, but I think it is something uh, nationwide. Uh, it is not limited to our studio or our channel. So I hope, inshallah, it will get fixed soon. Uh, Absar Mundal is having a serious question. Absar says, is the Holy Quran Khaliq or Makhluq? Actually, this question is asked by a person to my another friend. It doesn't matter whether it's asked by you or by another friend. And um, I have trained myself to treat questions as there is no silly question. If the person is asking to learn and he's really inquiring about the truth, he's not asking to cause chaos or is asking a problematic question to create problems, then there is no silly question. The word khaliq means creator. Allah says, Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Allah is the creator of everything. So, makhluq means being created. The Quran is neither khaliq nor makhluq. The Quran is not the creator, nor is it being created. The Qur'an is the word and the speech of Allah. So it is one of his faiths. When Allah says, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Allah spoke to Prophet Moses in words, a speech, in words and letters, in vows. So the Qur'an was said also by Allah the Almighty. He said it, he recited to Gabriel, and Gabriel recited it to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, through the revelation over a period of 23 years. So it's neither khaliq nor makhluk, neither uh, creating nor being created. Samira uh, <clears throat> Khan, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer the dua from a person who prays his prayer sooner than the one who doesn't? In the hadith, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked, what is the best deed? He said, As-salatu ala awwali waqtiha. The best deed is to offer the prayer on its earliest time, once the time has entered. You hear the adhan, you've heard the sunnah, and you offer the prayer, that is the greatest deed. This is one of the most favorable acts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person prayed 15 minutes later, valid. 20 minutes later, an hour later. As long as you prayed it before the next prayer is due, it's valid. But those who offer the prayer at its earliest time are dearer to Allah and better and superior. The matter of accepting the dua, 
the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, every time a believer makes dua, his or her dua will be accepted in one of three ways. As long as the dua, the prayer, is a prayer to obtain a good thing, to word of harm, <clears throat> and it's not a sin, or to sever the relationship with one's family members. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah could give you an immediate answer, or will postpone it for a divine wisdom. He could not answer your question, your mas'ala, your dua, in order to save it, so he will benefit you through this supplication on the day of judgment. This is where you need it most. Or who can protect you and ward you off from a word of an affliction or a harm that was about to befall you due to your earlier supplication. So bottom line is your dua is guaranteed to be accepted as long as you're making a good dua. Those who are offering the prayers at the earliest time are better and dearer and nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But those who offer the prayer later as long as before the next time their prayer is valid as well. The next question is uh, Suleiman Karuf is saying salam if a Christian person or family server, serves you meat. Is it okay to eat from it? When you don't know if they slaughtered it in a halal way, let me, let me tell you this. Nobody nowadays actually manages the slaughtering or the sacrifice by their own hands. You know, we live in big cities. So we buy the meat. We buy the meat from the grocery stores, from the shops. So the determining factor is not who served you the meat. It could be a Muslim. But he bought the meat from uh, HEB, from Walmart, from uh, Kroger. Any of these stores, do they slaughter? No, they don't. They have slaughtering houses that they deliver the meat to them. Was the meat slaughtered or sacrificed in the slaughterhouse? This is something that is known nationwide. If the slaughterhouse or houses in a country like in the USA, by law, they are obliged to uh, cut the head off or cut the jugular veins or remove the head before the animal is dead so that they drain the blood. And most of those who are doing this process are either Christians or Jews. It's halal. And whether they say Bismillah or they don't. This is what Allah said in Surah Al-Ma'idah. He said, وَطَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ You travel to another country, Buddhists, Hindus uh, were not allowed to eat their meat, which is slaughtered, even if it is slaughtered by them. Because the only exception, which is made in the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah, was the people of the book. The people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. Provided they actually slaughter the cattle, not kill it by electrocuting the animals, suffocating the animals, or by mass shooting, or by a stun gun, so the animal is dead. That's called mayta. Even if it is done by Muslim, and he says, Bismillah, and he turned the button on, and all the chicken were electrocuted, and they died, and said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's dead. It's dead animals. We don't eat them. Understand now? Uh, Abdullah ibn Yaqub is asking, uh, what is the ruling on using check to buy? Is it possible that the check payment will be higher than the cash payment? Uh, I, I personally never came across where I have to pay extra because I'm writing a check. I know the seller would prefer cash or credit card because once you swipe your card or a debit card, the money will be transferred to their accounts or by the end of the day or a day later. While it's for the check, it takes up to seven days to be cleared and to be cashed. And it could be a hot check. You never know, right? So the seller encounters the problem if there's a problem. But they don't charge extra if you're writing a check. Uh, uh, this is where I travel to many countries. I've never come across a seller where they ask you to pay extra. Even if they ask you to pay extra, the price is fixed. 
He agreed to it and he said, I'm writing you a check. Is this valid? Yes, it's valid. Because the check is as good as cash. We are assuming that the person who's writing a check is an honest person and it's not a hot check. Um, a question from one viewer. If I can't make up for my dead mother's missed days of fasting Ramadan, could I replace it with money? The priority is for making up the missed fasting. It is the duty of the children and the family members of the person who died while all in days of fasting. A woman, she owed seven days during the period last Ramadan, and after Ramadan, she made up two, three days and she died. May Allah have mercy on her. Her husband, her children should make up those missed days, the five remaining days. A mother died without making up some missed days and she said to her children, they should actually make up the missed days. In case that no one is there to make it up and you are the person cannot afford, then as if the person is living exactly, you will say to the person, pay the kafara, feed one miskin for each day. So you can do that. Mary Porcaro, Sister Mary is saying, Assalamu alaikum, check. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Her question is, is it necessary to wipe your face with your hands after praying salah prayers? Like if it is wiping away sins. And please explain to me, tahajjud salah prayer, is it all year round from after Isha prayer, finish to fajr? All right. First of all, many people ask about the permissibility of wiping over your face after the prayer or after you recite your adhkar or after you make dua. We don't have any sound reference that either the Prophet ﷺ did so or approved doing so. So we leave it as is. We don't do that. The, you know, if somebody feels comfortable that he wipes over his face and so on, that leads to the following. Look what the sister said. Oh, does it uh, like if it is wiping away your sins? You see now, it's not just simple act where you feel good that you removed your glasses, you rub your eyes, and you fix your beard. No, it is extended to, I believe that, wiping your face is similar to wiping off the sins of your face. No, that is not true. Don't do that. Don't do that. We know that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا تَوَضَّأَ الْمُسْلِمُ فَأَسْبَغَ الْوُضُوءُ Whenever a believer performs ablution and he perfects his or her wudu, his or her sins come out of their bodies and to the point that they come from beneath their fingers. When they wash their faces, their sins fall from their faces. That is in wudu, right? But there is no reference that if you do that after the prayer, after the finishing of the prayer or making dua, it is sunnah or it is recommended whatsoever. So it has nothing to do with these practices. Her questions about tahajjud, uh, the tahajjud word was mentioned in the Quran uh, in Surah Al-Isra, when the Almighty Allah says, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدَ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ عَسَىٰ أَيَّبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا so Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was recommended by Allah the Almighty to offer tahajjud, which is a night prayer, especially the last part of the night. And the tahajjud is, as Allah said, nafila. It is a voluntary prayer. It is not mandatory. But it is the honor of the believer. It is one of the most favorite prayers before Allah because the person offers it with utmost sincerity, people are asleep. The night prayer, Sister Mary, begins from sunset. That's the night. Till dawn. So even if you pray between Maghrib and Isha, that's called night prayer. Qiyamul Layl. 
But its ideal time and its best time is to be offered in the last one third of the night. Whether you take a nap, you sleep a little bit and you get up before Fajr to pray, or if you're awake and you decided to pray at midnight or past midnight, or the last part of the night, all of that counts as tahajjud. She also says, I was praying tahajjud prayer late at night last week, and I think uh, it is called tahajjud every time. I would recite the Fatiha, I was crying so much. Why is that? Is it a good thing? I was scared while I was reciting, feeling like I was standing in front of Allah. It's perfect. It's wonderful if you can maintain doing so. When the person cries in the prayer, out of fear of Allah, out of love of Allah, pondering over the ayat, ayat Surah Al-Fatiha, this is praiseworthy act. This is highly recommended. There is no problem with that. It's beautiful if you can maintain doing so. And that's a sign of sincerity, especially no one is around you to see you while you are uh, crying. Uh, I believe we'll take one more question to wrap it up. Uh, from Idris, uh, Abu Aisha is asking, if I regularly wake up before Fajr to pray two rak'ah for tahajjud, should my wit be one rak'ah or three? The least number of units for wit is one rak'ah. Imam Abu Hanifa requires that it should be preceded by any prayer. You cannot just get up and pray one rak'ah and say this is wit. But it's valid according to the rest of the imams. Perfectly valid, as the Prophet ﷺ said, فَأَوْتِرْ وَلَوْ بِرَكَعَةً So praying the two rak'ahs, sunnah to isha or any two rak'ahs, then praying one rak'ah as which valid. Praying three rak'ahs all together with one tashahud and taslim by the end as which that's valid. You know, praying two rak'ahs in tashahud and taslim, then one rak'ah by itself and tashahud and taslim, that is also valid. Brothers and sisters, until next time, I ask the Almighty Allah to teach us what we don't know and to guide us to what is best and to inspire us to work upon this guidance. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen. Advance.